how it is. I guess it's a Friday afternoon and it's warm. And it's going to be a quite technical talk, but I hope it will still be uh, relatively fun. And I try to make it um, yeah, also accessible if you haven't had much contact with cubicle type theories and these kinds of things. Maybe to get an idea, um, who has heard about cubicle type theory in some way or another? Heard? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> heard about it in some way, seen it maybe in some guys ah, in a paper, used it. Oh, two users, that's good. Three users. Um, yeah, then I hope there will also be something in it for you, but I think this should also be approachable for uh, everyone in the audience to get an idea what it's like to, to reason in, in cubicle type theories, in cubicle actor in particular. So that's kind of the, the theorem prover we had in mind uh, when working on this. Um, and in a nutshell, this project is kind of trying to um, get a tactic for, for cubicle type theory. So to automate one class of proofs that is novel to cubicle type theory, um, such that the user doesn't have to do it um, because it can be quite, quite painful, um, but also to get an idea kind of if we really think that cubicle type theory is, is logic, what does this logic work like in, in practice or from a computational point of view, from an automatic reasoning point of view? So yeah, really look at this as logic, even though um, we of course know it comes from something which doesn't really feel logic-y. Um, so cubicle type theory in some sense can be seen as an implementation of homotopy type theory. So HOT um, kind of is based on the recognition that there seems to be some correspondence between um, spaces in some way and equalities in a proof-relevant setting. And yeah, homotopy type theory kind of worked out this, this correspondence and cubicle type theory kind of tried to make this yeah, into a proper logic. So that's kind of the, the motivation for, for cubicle type theory. So in a computationally well-behaved way, um, it ought to be a, a type theory in which we can talk about Equalities in a similar way as we can talk about topological spaces or homotopy types of topological spaces. Um, so, what cubicle type theory does, it uh, really takes this correspondence that Hot kind of set out to develop literally and says that, uh, well, proof relevant equalities over like some, some type A, um, they're really just paths in a topological sense, and paths are functions out of some form of the interval. So, that's what cubicle type theory does. Has like some notion of an interval, and it says, well, paths are just maps out of this into my base type. And now, um, higher paths are just something where I have multiple um, intervals from which I map into my A. So we kind of have an n fold product of the I, and from this we map into A, and if we let's say have three interval variables, then we have a three dimensional path or equality. Um, so that's kind of the, the basic idea. Um, in our setting, we, we kind of have set up some, some syntax to, uh, to talk about these paths. Um, in particular, we will only talk about the paths in a single type. So imagine we have like some base type that is fixed throughout this whole talk. And we'll only consider paths in like this, this base type. And then we make some assumptions what this base type has. For instance, we say, okay, we have some zero dimensional paths. So some very simple thing X here in our type A. And now we construct a one-dimensional path. So this is why we have this i here. So we say we have a single interval variable, i.e. we construct kind of a, a function if we think about this topologically from i to the one into our type. Uh, and here we can now construct our terms and these will have some boundary. So this is kind of the, the type of this term. Um, it's all living in this base type A or in equalities over this base type A, so we don't have to specify this. We just have to specify, okay, what is the kind of the, yeah, the endpoints of this path that we're constructing. So that's the, the essential idea of this syntax, um, and we'll get used to the syntax over, over the course of this talk a bit. Um, but this is, really allows us to single out what we want to talk about. We want to talk about paths in a single or over a single type, and kind of how we can construct paths, how they interact with one another. Um, so that's kind of the, the domain of discourse um, for our problems that we study. So here um, we said, okay, we have a base point x, and then in a context where we have a single variable, we again have just a path x, kind of it's the constant x path. Um, so really we can think of this as, okay, we can go from x to x by constantly staying at x. So kind of whenever we draw an arrow here, 
uh, and here we have the little variables that um, lie in our context, um, then here we said, okay, if we have an i in our context, then x is really a constant path. So in cubicle actor, or like in a more tight theoretic fashion, you might write what I did up here just as, okay, we have some lambda function which takes an i into an x. Um, we essentially now just have a different form of this where we uh, write this i on the left-hand side of the turnstile symbol, but really it's like, yeah, we have a function. So the constant x function uh, we can always construct. That's nice enough, right? So our equality that we're capturing is reflexive, um, as we would hope. Um, but of course, we want more structure for, for this to look like equality. And to have this behave like equality, we have to have uh, another reasoning principle. So what's on top of the slide here, the, these Kahn compositions is what we need. And um, this is kind of one of the main reasoning principles that we studied from, a, from an automatic reasoning point of view. How can we come up systematically with these Kahn compositions? Now, these really look quite topologically, so they are inspired by cubicle sets, which kind of inspired cubicle type theory. Um, but we try to yeah, not think about topology, really. We try to just treat this as a principle of logic and see what happens when we reason about this or with this principle automatically. Um, now, what, what is Kahn composition? As a simple example, uh, let's try to construct the inverse, right? So we have an equality. It's reflexive now. Let's say we also want uh, it to be symmetric. So given some path Q, uh, which goes from X to Y, we would expect that we can also go from Y to X, right? So we look for some path from Y to X. Um, so to uh, familiarize with our, us with our syntax here, we have two base points, X and Y. We have our path Q. And of this I just says, OK, this is a one-dimensional path, and we can use I here in the boundary description. And now we want to, again, construct something which is one-dimensional. So we have a single uh, interval variable I here. And we now want to have something which goes from Y to X. Um, and to construct this, we can use Kahn composition, which here, kind of the slogan said, uh, we have to construct higher dimensional open cubes. Um, well, what does this mean for a one-dimensional path? Like a higher cube for a one-dimensional path is a two-dimensional path, i.e. a square. So we have to construct an open square uh, in, in a way that yeah, it, it, it matches or like it, it, it works out with the, with the boundaries. Uh, and then Kahn composition will give us kind of what is missing of this open cube. So that's the, the essence of Kahn composition. We want to go from y to x. And we can do this in cubical type theory by saying, well, we have this higher Q, which is a two-dimensional cube, and we can fit sides uh, of this open cube in a matching way. So Q, we said, goes from X to Y. So here we have an X, that there are Y, so here we can stay constantly at X. Here we can stay so constantly at X, so this matches up the, the boundaries of the sides. And now this term here, I called it H comp, or yeah, you can think of it as a comp composition, but in cubicle act, it's really called H comp, so this is why I call it like this. This term of this open cube, so this is just a term representation of this geometric figure, really gives us the missing side. So this is what you will see when you use cubicle actor. You actually have to construct these H comps. Um, so here we can unfold the notation a bit. This inner thing just says what the sides of our cube are. So the i equal 0 side is our qj, the i equal 1 side is our x, and then this last bit is the, the back side of our cube. So the thing that lies opposite of the thing we want to construct. Um, so this is yeah, the, essentially the idea of Kahn composition, and now this project was about trying to apply this automatically, uh, which means we have to come up with these open cubes here. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah. Do you call it H comp because you fixed A? Um, a and H comp? Like, I'm guessing H is for homogeneous and you're not dependent. It's not a dependent version because you fix the type A. Exactly. Yeah, so it's a homogeneous quality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Could you do the different open Q were here at the bottom and Y on the left? So if we have, maybe the arrows aren't really visible, but if we have Q here, then we have an X here, right? Uh, no. okay. And then we have to go from X to Y. Sure. Um, I think this is the only 
solution. Well, in, in this case, maybe, but in other cases, you have a multiple. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the solution is absolutely not unique. And in particular, you can, uh, you can also solve this with multiple count compositions. Uh, so also this solution is not unique, just like if you have one have a single count composition, it's unique. Yeah. So for this H comp right now is a, is a term of type is cube shape, but what I wanted is a specific map from Y to X, right? So, um, oh no, so, so this H comp really is a term, is a one-dimensional path. So, so you have an does the lift and just takes that lift out? It doesn't remember. It just doesn't remember the cube itself. Doesn't. Yeah, exactly. There's also like like in general there would be a more general term than the the H comp, which also allows you to fill this thing. But we don't need to worry about this in this talk. So it's kind of automatically does it. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the, the projection, if you will, to this like one dimensional thing. You can uh, implement the higher dimensional case with this one. I mean, depending on your on the cubical type theory. Yeah, yeah, so in our paper we have a more general thing than the H comp, which kind of allows you to either talk about the one dimensional thing or the square filler, uh, whatever you want. Um, and also allows you to fill in various directions. So we will always kind of fill in this direction from bottom to top. Oh. Um, so just to follow up on that, to make sure I understand. So this gives you the top dashed arrow. Yeah. It just tells you like there is an arrow from, or there is identity from Y to X. Yeah. But so far, it doesn't give you the inverse proof that it's an inverse of Q, right? Yeah, because exactly. for that you need the whole filler. Yeah, yeah. Okay. exactly. Good. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, so we also have the proof that it's the inverse um, mm -hmm. by something you sometimes is called fill, perhaps, mm -hmm. because it kind of fills this square as opposed to just giving the composition in this direction. Um, yeah, kind of the, the, the general thing works out. But what we are interested in here mostly is really finding this, these things, because finding the one-dimensional path is the computationally difficult one. Because, for instance, if you're faced with this square and have to show that Q composed with what we thought here was the inverse, that's easier, kind of, maybe not type theoretically, but like from a proof search point of view, it's relatively direct to proof. Okay. Great, so let's try to come up with these uh, yeah, compositions, these h comps more systematically. Um, so now we want to show that this, what we say is equality, uh, is transitive. So that given two paths, q and r, uh, which go from x to y and y to z, we can also go from x to z. So I omitted the base points in the context here, but yeah, we just said x, y, z being base points. And now we want to construct a one-dimensional path from x to z. Well, we do the same thing as we just did. We have an open square, and we need to find um, some terms which fit in here, so they need to match with the goal boundary, and they also need to match here. Um, well, how can we do this systematically? Um, we can do this with constraint satisfaction programming. So if you're a computer scientist, you might have heard about this. This is just a general tool that allows you to solve a whole lot of problems. For instance, you can solve Sudokus with, with constraint satisfaction programming. It's essentially, like the idea I think is, is quite, quite direct. We want to find solution for these three variables, which we called in, in this way here. Uh, we have some domains for each of these variables. So for instance, this vi0, well, the only thing we can put here probably is an x, right? Because we have to have at the left endpoint an x, and everything we have in the context uh, has something else apart from the constant x path. So really, like, here we can't do much than just applying the constant x path. Uh, for i1, we can do a bit more. We can either stay constantly at z, or we can go from y to z. So this is what the r uh, path did for us. Um, for the back, we can really do anything ad hoc, right? Because we don't have any, anything that restricts our, our domain here. Um, and now, after like, saying, okay, initially these are possible solutions for each of these variables, um, we also have to impose the constraint that their boundaries have to match. So, for instance, here for this path, the right endpoint has to be equal to the left endpoint of this path. So, this is what this says. And the same for, for this thing here. Um, and this is now a constraint satisfaction problem. So, it has a set of uh, variables with associated domains and a set of constraints. Yeah. So, here you are assuming that you will. Uh... Uh, require only two dimensions. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, kind of, we we said, okay, we can solve this problem 
probably by just using a single open square. Let's try to find the square. Um, and the, the point being is, if we phrase this problem in this way, we can use just standard constraint satisfaction solvers to solve this. So you actually don't have to implement anything. I did implement some, some small, very naive solver. Um, and this works um, and finds the solution in a, in a systematic way. So for instance, uh, the solver will probably realize, OK, here we have a single solution. So we can instantiate x for our left side of our open square. Uh, well, this means the domain for this bottom uh, path really shrinks a lot because it can't be y, z, or r anymore because then it wouldn't match up with the left-hand side. Uh, let's pick one of these. Let's pick perhaps q, uh, in which case then also the z, z for this side can't hold anymore. So we have to have the r here, which then also gets rid of the x possibility for the bottom one. Um, so in this way, the, the constraint satisfaction solver will quickly find a solution, maybe using some backtracking. But the crucial thing is, like, it's a relatively easy problem, and we can solve it quickly. Um, so we find this solution for, for showing concatenation of paths works, i.e. transitivity of equalities. Um, so kind of the first uh, ingredient that we did, or like, that we used in our solver and our tactic, is constraint satisfaction solving with finite domains, right? Here, these were really always just a finite selection, uh, co co collection of terms. Um, so this is a decidable problem, this small problem that we look at. But of course, um, if you kind of seen kind of composition some way, in general, it's not a decidable problem to find if there's a kind of composition for some term, because uh, crucially, it can be that one of the sides actually can't be solved directly by like one of these simple terms, but is itself the result of a kind of composition. So for instance, when we now have three paths, P, Q, and R, and we want to concatenate all three of them, we can't do this with a single kind of composition. Um, now what our solver does is uh, it will still employ the finite domain constraint satisfaction solver and will just leave some sites open. So what this looks like is it will say, okay, I can't solve this directly. Like if you, if you kind of call the pre previous procedure, you will find no solution. So now let's just say, okay, I want to fill two of these sites with simple terms and I'll leave open the backside. Um, so one of these solutions for these two, two sides would be W and R. Um, so this means we kind of have a partial solution. We just have to find the backside of this H comp. And now this has the boundary W to Y, because R starts at Y. And we can again call our finite domain constraints at section solver to come up with an H comp for, for this thing here, which can now be done. So in this way, we can of compose these two solutions to one solution to really get a path from W to Z. Yeah? Why wouldn't the first suggestion of the system just be W and Z on both sides? Like, how would it know to use R? That's it wouldn't. It, it will have to do backtracking. Um, so you're uh, absolutely right. Like, so with all options, just keeps going. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Can you launch the constraint server on the three-dimensional cube here and get the result? Yeah, yeah, so this is for uh, shortly, in, in a bit we'll also do some, some higher dimensional things. Um, this is kind of about the basic setup, and it's of course not super impressive for one-dimensional paths, but the, the crucial thing is it generalizes to arbitrary dimensions. Um, yeah, so as I said, the first ingredient is a finite domain constraint satisfaction solver. Now, the second ingredient, or like the second idea, I guess, is um, we still use this finite domain constraint solver, but kind of when it fails, we leave sides open of our cube and then try to match more and more cubes to our base cube. So in some way, we kind of try to build simple shapes and just extend the, the cubes out a bit if we have to, but hopefully not as much as, not all that much. Um, but yeah, in this way, we, we can still use our CSP solver in the background. Um, now, before we go to higher dimensions, there's also one other thing, one other important thing that if you're a user of cubicle acta, you might have noticed. Here, like I always said, well, we just have a few simple terms, right? There's not that much to worry about. Like we have P, Q, and R in the base points here. There aren't all that much possibilities. Um, actually, in many cubicle type theories, you will have not only these terms, but also more kind of ways to, to build up these, these simpler sites. So to build up terms uh, apart from using hand composition. Um, 
So in cubic lacta, for instance, you have this connection, this or, or maximum connection, you also have the minimum connection and a cubic lacta reversal. We won't worry about this reversal for now. Um, yeah, but these connectives, uh, they give us other ways to, to build up cubes. Um, we also have what kind of coming from a cubicle set terminology are called degeneracies. Quite often, the degeneracies. Uh, we have diagonals, so we have kind of also, apart from current compositions, a selection of operations which allow us to also construct cubes. Uh, so these simple terms turn out to be not so simple after all, um, so we should also spend some time thinking about dealing with these. Uh, because they are nice as they allow us to construct some cubes directly, which would take a lot of kind of ingenuity to construct with count compositions. For instance, this square, um, which allows, which, which is built by the OR connective, um, gives a filler, so it's kind of a bit shaded. I hope you can, you can see this because it fills this square, which goes from Q in the one direction and then stays at Y and goes with Q in the other direction and then stays at Y. So this OR allows us to essentially take a one-dimensional path Q and kind of stretch this into a square in some way. So this is why we call kind of the, both the connectives but also the degeneracies and, and all these kind of simple operations. Contortions, they kind of allow you to contort a path into a high dimension with a certain boundary. Um, and <laughs> we want this in a cubicle type theory probably because this, writing this term is quite simple. Uh, constructing this square as a H-comp is more difficult. So you can also construct this in kind of the basic theory we just looked at without the connectives by constructing an open higher dimension, or like a three-dimensional cube and fitting sides in a certain way and fillers. So this can be done, but it's difficult and a solver will likely not want to do this all the time. So we do want to have these contortions um, because they shorten the proofs, but they mean that the simple terms are not so simple anymore. Um, for instance, if we just add this OR and the AND connective, then we suddenly have a lot of simple terms. Um, so if you take these two, these two connectives, um, then the resulting cubicle type theory is usually called dedicated cubicle type theory because the ways to kind of stretch a one-dimensional path into n dimensions is now growing with the Dedekind numbers. So, for instance, we have d of 6, so like over 7 million ways to turn a one-dimensional path into a six-dimensional cube. Um, so, suddenly the search space grows extremely quickly. Um, and this is, of course, an issue because in our constraint satisfaction solver, we will just for a start, need to list the domains, right? And if you want to build like some six-dimensional cube and you just list all the possible contortions of a one-dimensional one cube, you will end up having to list seven million terms without, before you can even start solving anything. So that's, that's not very nice and not very promising to, to find, find solutions. Um, so, yeah, how can we kind of deal with this conundrum that on the one hand we want these contortions, on the other hand they mean that yeah, finding these simple terms already gets no trivial. Um, for these contortions in particular, so these are kind of a subset of what you can do in, in cubic lacta, um, we have luckily a nice characterization which is allowing us to, to construct these contortions more gradually. Um, so we can treat these terms which are built from using the OR and AND connective uh, equivalently using certain poset maps. And in this way, we kind of get a grip on building these contortions gradually. So that's kind of the, the third idea that I want to, to mention before we go to solving higher dimensions. Um, now the correspondence between these Dedekind contortions and these poset maps is actually quite, uh, quite intuitive because here you can look at this as a propositional formula. Right, so we have two variables, i and j, and we take the formula i or j. Now if we look at the truth table of this formula, um, so here we have the evaluation kind of, of the two variables i and j, so this would correspond to i being evaluated to zero, j being evaluated to zero, well then i or j will also be zero, right? Um, if either one of these two variables, i or j, is one, then we will go to one, so in this way kind of the errors just correspond to the evaluation or the, the, the truth table corresponding to this formula. 
And now if we draw this into, or like, if we draw this truth table as a map between post sets, we get some intuition for why the boundary of this contortion is the way it is, because um, here we said, okay, we stay, we go to the zero, so it's kind of the left end point of the queue, um, but if we then go from zero, zero to zero, one, we are on the right hand side have passed from zero to one down, so in some way this boundary or like this side of the square will have the queue path on its side, um, whereas if we then go down again, um, we'll stay constantly at the left right end point of Q, which is the, the Y path, uh, which means that here really we have a constant Y. So in this way, this square really corresponds to, 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 to this square, but I think the, the POSET map perspective allows you to give, gain some intuition for why, why this boundary is the way it is. I think here, if you've kind of seen this aura already, you might have guessed what the square looks like, but it's kind of hard to, to see in general how this comes about. With kind of the, the truth table corresponding to this formula, we actually get some, some geometric intuition. Um, yeah, this is like one instance of stone duality, so it's kind of a, a very general thing, but really we just try to use it very concretely here, um, because we now can suddenly talk about truth tables instead of formulas in some way, and this makes it easier to construct something gradually. Any uh, remarks, any questions so far? Okay, so, um, yeah, I said it's nice because it gives us some, some geometric intuition, um, but also it's nice because we can kind of construct, can construct these things partially easier, or we can um, kind of combine a lot of contortions in, into a single, uh, single thing with, with less data. Um, so this is how, how we use these uh, post-set maps in, in our solver. Um, if we now, for instance, again want to contort our queue, but we don't quite know how to contort it yet. We just know, okay, at the bottom left end point, we want to stay at the left end point of queue. At the bottom, or at the top right, we want to stay at, at, at the right end point of queue, but we don't know what we want to do for these two uh, endpoints or the, these two vertices of our or square yet, um, then we can kind of represent this, this push that pose that map, which still has kind of some, some choice uh, in a very concise fashion. We could just say, okay, we send this vertex to this and this to this, but here for, for these two vertices, we have a choice between zero and one. Uh, and now this kind of pose that map contortion will represent really four contortion, contortions at the same time, because we can then uh, make, make these choices for, for either one of these two vertices, uh, and this will give us four different shapes, um, which if we kind of look at them in the formula perspective again, will correspond to just QI, QJ, QI or J, or QI and J. Um, and we didn't have to kind of explicitly list four terms, we really just had this kind of map, which maps from uh, the left-hand side to the um, power side of the right-hand side. And, I mean, for two dimensions, this isn't very impressive yet, but for higher dimensions, this really makes a huge difference because then uh, here, kind of the, the size of these domains really grow only exponentially, which is good in this case with the size of the cube and not uh, with the data numbers anymore. Yeah? So is the squares the one cells labeled Q or ones that are like degenerate in some sense? Yeah, because exactly. The ones not are kind of non-trivial. The Q label is kind of confusing because they don't have the same boundary or what they happen. Okay. It's the idea that a Q is a one cell and so, so yeah, so I'm uh, the Qs are not all the same, right? Oh, the Qs should all be just path from let's say X to Y. And I kind of omitted these things here, but like this will be the constant X path, this will be the constant Y path, this will be the constant X path, this, this will be the constant Y path. These both will be here constant Y paths and these both will be constant x paths. Okay. It's the other way around, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it's a bit lean, this, this syntax. But the crucial thing is we can kind of specify partially what our contortions should look like, right? Because what these all share is, like these four squares, they all have the same vertex here, namely x, and the same vertex y. Right? We just have different ways of going from x to y. Why is this called contortions of degenerate cubes? I mean, degenerate, they, they are not only, like these two, I guess you would usually call degenerate cubes, but I think... 
Yeah, I mean, I think the, we have the issue that the terminology is not really clear. We also have something like diagonals, which I think are commonly not called that generally because you go one dimension down instead of up. So kind of we, we wanted to capture that like all these basic transformations on cubes are just like contorting some shape in some slightly different shape. Yeah. I think from a homotopy theorist, that's maybe not the nice or like a useful notion, but kind of from a proof search point of view, we really have like these basic transformations and we have the card compositions. And now we, we started out with the card compositions, now we developed some way to concisely represent like the, the simpler transformations, um, and these allow us to, to also do higher dimensional cube solving, at least like have a go at Added because we can now, for instance, course, uh, represent the domains very concisely and then can try to um, reduce or like narrow down the search space by just looking at sim simple vertices. Um, and then also the, the monotonicity on this post map will also allow us to restrict our search space so we, we kind of have a way to yeah, gradually build up a contortion and not just mix and match um, as before. So uh, we will actually not only do some two-dimensional cubes, but we will solve some three-dimensional cubes. So that's uh, the, the remaining part uh, of my talk is about using this in practice, this algorithm. So let's try to automatically uh, prove the Ekman-Hilton argument, um, which is a classical result in um, yeah, algebra, I guess, but also uh, in, in homotopy theory. Like, it's the result that if you have two, two cells, it doesn't matter in which order you concatenate them. Um, and in our setting, two, two cells really are just two squares, which have a constant base point at all, all of their boundaries. So kind of topologically, these are really just two loops around the same base point. Um, and now we want to show that it doesn't matter in which way we concatenate them. Um, whether we first take the first one and then the second one or the other way around. Um, and now the kind of most direct way to express this in the cubicle setting looks maybe a bit weird at first, but we'll kind of then see how this um, yeah, can be treated as the Ekman-Hilton argument. Um, the, the, the cubicle Ekman-Hilton argument will put these two squares in a three-dimensional cube in different orders. So in this cube, let's say we go from here, from this point here, or actually, I guess, from this one in the back to this one on the top right, right? So this is the direction of the cube. And now we can either go by first going along P, so the bottom square here, and then Q, the right side here, or first along Q here, and then P on the top. So in this way, we kind of go uh, along P and Q in different orders uh, across the cube. So if we are able to find um, a term with this boundary, i.e. if we find this, this cube filler, we have proved Ekman-Hilton in, in a cubical setting. Yeah. This, uh, J and P, I and Q. AJ and QAJ, right? Ah, yeah, sorry, yeah, absolutely. So P and Q are variables, uh, are terms of two variables, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, so P and Q are different from the previous P and Qs, they are now really two dimensional. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, derive this term, and when we want to find this three cube as the as a result of Kahn composition, we have to construct an open four-dimensional cube which has this thing on the boundary, right? Any guesses what this might be? No, it is of course uh, impossible to construct the hand, but luckily we have a computer and we have our solver implemented. So we can ask our solver, and this will find the following hcomp. So this is now slightly different syntax from ours. It's, uh, the syntax of cubical actor already. So it will tell us, okay, I can find you this term um, using a four-dimensional open cube. So we have three dimensions on the sides and one, one back side. So in our syntax, this is the, the term that uh, was just found by our cube solver. 
Um, and actually, if you like type this in in cubicle acta, this will accept this as a proof of, of this statement. Um, we can actually make sense of this uh, for cube in some way. It looks a bit forbidding, um, but yeah, Evan Cavallo came up with a nice kind of diagram which describes how this Kahn composition really captures that these two ways of, comp of concatenating P and Q are the same. So we said in the beginning, okay, these P things here on the bottom and top, um, these are the, the P squares. And now our composition says that, that we kind of can imagine that we live inside this three-dimensional cube and we build a four-dimensional cube and we somehow kind of have to find the missing sides of our tesseract. So we have to find seven three-dimensional cubes. So these are the seven three-dimensional cubes. And now um, the I dimensions tell us that we actually trace our P squares to the back side. So in some way we kind of have in the inside here two three-dimensional cubes which will turn or take this P path and put it on the back side here. Uh, and it's kind of put on the back side in a way that it cancels out. So this means the two P squares here actually vanish such that we only have two Q, squ two, two Q squares here and here. Uh, and we can then, in the middle of our cube, turn the constant, the Q square into the other Q square just by staying constantly at Q. So in this way, like, there's some geometric intuition into this uh, weird term, um, we can imagine. Um, and yeah, the nice thing is that this really proves eggman hilton You can also kind of turn this into a more classically looking version of the eggman hilton argument where you don't have to do a lot of work anymore. Like, this is really the essence of, of Ekman Hilton in, in, in a cubicle setting. Yeah. You could also have used the definition of H field in terms of H comp and then for this, right? Yeah, so. Does this give the same results? Um, not directly. So, you mean we could kind of have Ekman Hilton formulated using kind of our previous. H comps that allowed us to concatenate two parts. No, using H field. Yeah. So H field can be defined in terms of H comp with, yeah. the, with the, uh, a contortion. So if you uh, write the H field to get the inside of the cube, if you unfold the definition of H, H field, you get a, you get an H comp with uh, some contortions in there. So uh, I was wondering if if you get the same solution or uh, approximately the same. Uh, I haven't looked at this way of constructing this yet. I would expect it to be quite similar. I, I have a feeling it's the same because the proof of filling from composition is already included in that connection construction. And, and yeah. going to high dimensions, so it's, I think, they will commute. The tool. Yeah, but <laughs> it would be nice to see a yeah. proof in the tool that yeah. you have. So, mm. uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, the solver will certainly try to look for something like this. So the solver usually tries to find like a, an H comp, so really like a higher dimensional thing. Uh, yeah, and I guess that these two connectors here, as you know, I said, so this is really, I think, the essence of the cubical Edmund Hilton argument. Is this where you said something vanishes? Is this related to that degenerate thingy with the connection part? Um, I guess so. Yeah. So I think like these connectors kind of have the effect of putting these two squares to the back side I see. in a way that they vanish. Right. Yeah. Like this is quite hand wavy, yeah. but I think this is kind of topologically what happens. So this is the idea I got from theory Cocon's proof of filling from composition. Yes. So that's so the basic idea behind. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, but this adds kind of to the set of proofs of the Eggman Hilton argument, which oh. always look different in, in every setting. Um, the cubicle one doesn't look super nice in the beginning, but I think it's concise. You can maybe put it this way. Um, okay. Ah, there we go. So, to sum up uh, what we've seen so far, um, the search problem that we studied was really about two different search problems. Um, so, kind of, what we discussed in the middle were these contortions. So, these kind of simpler ways to 
to construct new cubes from, from the cubes in your context that you have. Um, we also studied this problem kind of from a complexity point of view. We got some first results, but I think we are yeah, far from really having characterized the complexity of the different problems corresponding to the different cubical type theories properly. Um, the, the takeaway being it's really a complex problem. Like these contortions, they're always only finitely many for a given dimension, so it's a decidable problem, but it's a hard problem. Um, it certainly subsumes satisfiability checking in some way. I feel like it's also co NP hard, like it's, it's a hard problem. I think it would be nice to really have a better grip on this. Um, and uh, we only looked at the Dedekind uh, contortions, but there are other proposals for, for kind of, yeah, contortions uh, on which you base your cubical type theory. And I think it would be nice maybe to have a better idea, okay, how do these really relate? Yeah. Do you have an intuition why you think it's co NP? Um, so, I mean, the, it really depends on what you define as the input size. Um, but in terms of, like, if you have a one-dimensional path uh, or like a two-dimensional path and you want to turn it into an arbitrary cube, I actually have a proof that it's coin p-hard. I can show this to you if you're, yes. if you're interested. Mm -hmm. um, so we really have shown that it's coin p-hard. I don't think it's in coin p. Um, yeah. But then if you treat like the other way around as the input size, so if you look at turning an arbitrary dimension, or like a n-dimensional cube into a square, this is np hard. Yeah, it's, I think, a zoo of results that you could um, come up with. We have kind of have some, some very first work. Um, yeah, but I think it's kind of interesting from a both logical point of view and, and yeah, maybe also from a topological point of view, how, how these different theories relate. Um, then, kind of, yeah, it's a, Difficult problem because it's a huge search space, but it's at least decidable. For these Kahn compositions, um, you have to take my word for it that it's undecidable, but um, yeah, we can also relatively directly express problems with, with Kahn compositions that are known to be undecidable. So for instance, the word problem for groups you can express with these squares, and then I think already the fact that you can extend your cube out in arbitrary directions uh, should convince you that, okay, this is an undecidable problem. So really here we the only thing we can hope for is like some sensible enumeration. So we have to employ heuristics to find these Kahn compositions uh, nicely. The heuristics that we came up with was um, we probably don't want to have like super many nested edge comp terms, right? It will be nice to have like simple cubes. So this is why we try to always use like contortions if possible and then only extend a cube out to one side if we have to. So it's in some way like some breadth first search when we kind of look at these cubes um, as, as graphs. Um, but yeah, in this way, we've found a procedure which yeah, works quite well in practice. So a lot of the terms that are hoping to come up by hand, we can solve in a few milliseconds. Um, so it's, it's a good first heuristic. Um, we can interface with like a known procedure to solve a whole class of problems, so these finite domain constraints for us, we can just interface at some point if we want to. So that's a nice property of our algorithm. Um, yeah, and we also explored like some way to deal with the humongous search space for the contortions in, in our tool. Um, yeah, which which also worked, worked relatively well. Um, yeah, we started out by, or usually we started out by noting that we have homogeneous composition. It would of course be nice if we also Deal dealt with heterogeneous equalities, so paths between different types. So this is also something you can do in, in cubical type theory. Um, so yeah, dealing with these, I think, probably doesn't mean we have to change our search strategies a whole lot, but it would mean we would have to generalize our our theory. So at the moment, we can only work always in a single a single type. Um, then these kind of compositions, I think, are. Uh, reasoning principle that trips many people up when starting to work with cubical acta, but it's of course not the only reasoning principle. Um, so transporting using trumps is, trump is another primitive of cubical acta, which is also tricky, and I guess which is related to, uh, yeah, how many other theories also kind of deal with, yeah, transporting among equalities and all that, so I think to deal with this in a systematic way, it probably is worthwhile to not only look at cubical type theories, but to take a, take a broader view. Um, 
Then univalence, I mean, that's kind of the, this, or like the, the main the unique selling point of cubic lacta is it has computational univalence. Um, of course, this suggests maybe we also want to reason about this automatically. I think actually in practice, you don't need to use univalence all that much, so I'm not sure if like, there's need for some automation for this, but yeah, I just wanted to mention this is not the only reasoning principle of cubic type theory that we've looked at, um, yeah, and I think there's, there's certainly more, more things to be done. Um, I said, yeah, we kind of took a first step towards having, or like we, we came up with our first heuristic. Um, there are, of course, many other things you can try, and I think it would be just interesting to see what works well in, in which settings. Uh, so that's certainly not uh, any, uh, yeah, we've certainly not exhausted this search space of heuristics. Uh, from a practical point of view, I really want to make this part of the cubicle library, such that you only have to type like a cube solver and then it runs in the background. This doesn't work yet, but I hope over the summer I'll implement this. Uh, and yeah, Jeremy is already gone, but I think what I'm also interested in is how we can integrate this solver with proof search and dependent type theory, because quite often the terms that you're constructing are also in themselves in some way non-trivial from a dependent type theory point of view, you might have to instantiate some lemma or something like this, which will give you a path. So like this cube solver, you will have to in some way integrate with a dependent type theory uh, solver to really make it practical and to work in instances where yeah, you're not only looking at a topological problem. Um, yeah, but I think this is uh, further along with this future work. Um, you can try out the solver. Uh, it's just in Haskell, and you have to type up your problems in kind of the internal syntax. As I said, hopefully at some point you will, won't have to do it anymore, but if you want to have a look at this. And we also wrote up these, the syntax, but also the algorithms and the complexity theory themselves more properly, so you can check this out on the archive next month at FSCD. Uh, yeah, so that's it for me, finishing more on time than needed. But yeah, thanks Thank for your attention.